All right, I think we're, we're on the air. Okay, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to the uh, Interdisciplinary Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, it's a pleasure here uh, today to have uh, here uh, Dr. Anuj Shrivastava uh, from FSU, Department of Statistics. Uh, Anuj is uh, well known in the area of uh, shape analysis. He got his uh, PhD from Washington University, then went on and did his uh, postdoc at Brown University uh, for a year, working with Wolf and and then uh, and he's been at FSU now for se seven years. Yeah, so eight years. Eight years? Yeah. Oh, gee, even more. Time just flies. Time just flies when they're having fun. Yeah. Yeah. So he's been at FSU for eight years now, I just uh, realized. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank the, you. The floor is yours. Thanks, Amid, uh, for this invitation. And I hope I finish the talk without breaking the system down here. There are lots of components in the system. Uh, I think this is a comment uh, that should go in front of any shape analysis talk is that shape is a very generic word and a lot of different people use shape in many different ways. So what I'm going to talk about as shape analysis is definitely a perspective that I have. It's not a global definition of how shape analysis is done by everybody else. Okay. I want to talk about um, two things, the shapes of curves and shapes of surfaces, but as you'll see, most of the work actually does boil down to shape analysis of curves, and that's where I'll start. This work is supported by Army Research Office, and so one of the applications we are interested in is recognizing objects, uh, military vehicles, and uh, military-related objects in images. Uh, what is done traditionally in image analysis is if you look at the amount of information, you see I already messed up, the amount of information that is present in an image for, a, for an associate, for an object of interest, you can break it up into two pieces of information. There's an information about the colors, the textures that are on the object. When you, when you take a picture of an object, you have this pattern of pixels that is trying to tell you something about the object. So that's one piece of information. The other piece of information is to somehow try to understand the shape formed by the boundaries of this curve as it, as, as it appears in images. And so it's, it's this stream of uh, information that I want to pursue in this talk. There's a lot of work that has been done on understanding the, the patterns of pixels and trying to recognize objects based on that. Uh, among the prominent ideas are to study the histograms, in other words, the empirical frequencies of what pixel values appear. And so some patterns of histograms can also tell you about the objects. What I want to pursue is I want to think of shapes of boundaries of these uh, uh, objects in the images. And I want to view them as an element of some very high dimensional space, and I want to do a statistical inference in that space. Okay. So, there, so, so, so there is a, a rather daunting task of identifying the spaces in which these points are elements, and then how to do calculus on those spaces. Okay. Uh, a quick outline, I want to say something about the motivation, but having talked to the people here, there's no motivation required for studying shape analysis. Everybody realizes the importance of shape analysis. A little bit about our framework. A little bit about our framework, and so the main idea is how do you represent shapes mathematically, and then how do you start comparing these things? And so there is a basic tool that is needed, i.e. the use of geodesics on shape spaces, and I'll talk about that. And then a number of applications. And so this sort of outline tells you that this talk is at a very high level. I'm not going into details at any one of those ideas. Uh, if I was giving this talk in, say, statistics or a math department, I would have picked up one such item and have really gone through it more carefully. Um, as opposed to doing that, I just want to give you an overview. And, and if, if there is more interest on it, one can read papers or have more detailed discussions later on. So I want to start with the motivation. Looking at uh, objects in images, if we just extract the contours and ask the question, what information are we getting from the shapes of these contours, we do get some information. It may not be a perfect information. It may not be able to tell us exactly what that object is or what is it doing and what's the nature of that object. But we might be able to get some information. Maybe we'll be able to classify that object in a, in a broader category using the shape information. Okay. So there is a general purpose uh, interest in terms of object recognition. But then there are some specific problems we are dealing with. One specific problem is that we want to recognize people who are 
who are walking. We want to do a, this human ID recognition from a distance. And so what, what we have is uh, uh, videos of people walking, and we want to extract the sequence of shapes. So we are not interested in this case in one static shape, but we are interested in somehow a temporal evolution of shape, a stochastic process of shape. Okay? And we want to classify this whole process rather than studying individual shapes. Medical images are, again, very good example of uh, shape analysis. Uh, perhaps one of the most prominent area of applications of shape analysis is medical image analysis. In this case, we are interested in there are these uh, cardiac layers, these boundaries between these layers, and doctors have to uh, currently do and man go in there and manually extract these boundaries. And they, are, they evaluate the health of the heart beating um, by studying the change of these boundaries, okay, how these boundaries are changing in time. And, but we would like to do that automatically. We would like to extract these boundaries and study how the time, the, these things evolve in time and try to categorize the, the patient as healthy or not healthy based on this motion. Uh, some other examples uh, our group is collaborating with is uh, there are people uh, in, our, in our university who go around the world, take pictures of bones of dinosaurs and try to classify these uh, dinosaurs into different categories according to the shapes of these bones. And so sometimes you get complete bones, you can get the full, full structure, sometimes you get broken bones. Okay? So you can think of it as shape analysis using missing data. Okay? You do not have complete information. You touched it. So you I touched, touched it. it. Okay. So a few examples, few motivations. Everybody has their own pet motivation for doing shape analysis. What are the issues for doing the shape analysis? Shape is a very abstract notion. Shape is something in the eye of the beholder. What we consider as shape of an object uh, may not be the same notion everybody else holds. But to be able to do a quantitative analysis, to be able to form a statistical framework, we need to agree on at least a starting point of what should be the definition of shape. Okay? To be able to do that, we need to be able to represent this analytically, mathematically. What is a representation of shape? If you have a contour, a closed contour in a plane, how are you going to mathematically represent it so that you can do the analysis? And then one can take it further and talk about three-dimensional objects. I'll give you a brief a glimpse later on. In any which way you do the representation, the shape vector or shape function, whatever the representation is, it's not going to follow Euclidean calculus. That part is well established. There are certain invariances we want in shape. Shape analysis should be invariant to translation. It should be invariant to rotation. It should be invariant to scaling. Whenever you bring in all those inv invariances, the resulting space you get is very seldom a vector space. You cannot just add two shapes as vectors and get a new shape. Okay? So you really have to work with this nonlinear geometry. You really have to respect the nonlinear geometry and utilize it. Uh, in theory, if you look at the concept of shapes, it's an infinite dimensional space. Just look at space of closed curves, it's an infinite dimensional space. So you really are talking about doing calculus in this space. And then eventually, the applications of all these ideas, we want to be able to do all the things we do in general pattern recognition. We talk about clustering of, of, uh, clustering of points, uh, classification of shapes, testing whether the shape comes from this class or that class. Uh, what are the probability models uh, that capture the variation of shapes in a certain class? We want to do the full statistics. And so once we have understood the first few items, we can move on to and do the more ambitious things in the last. All right, so I want to talk about how do we do shape. Our group has done shape analysis. Of course, as I said, different people do things differently. So we start with a closed curve in a plane. Okay, we are, let's say we are interested in analyzing close, shape of a closed curve in a plane. There are many ways to represent this closed curve. You can just look at x and y coordinates as you go around the curve. The x, x coordinate evolves and the y coordinate evolves. So you can have these two functions as one representation. The function that we use is, is what we call the angle function, which is at any point you draw. I should. Yeah, is, you can use the pen. Ah, you can use the pen. this one? Yeah. Oh, okay. And you can write on the board. Okay. Uh, at any point, if you look at the tangent to the, vec uh, tangent to the curve at that point, the velocity vector, as you're walking along the curve, you look at the velocity vector, that velocity vector makes a certain angle with the x-axis. And what you can do is just keep track of these angles as you go around the curve. Okay? So it gives you an angle function. This rep representation does assume that you have a unit speed parameterization. That means you're walking around the curve at a unit speed. It simplifies things. And so you can represent such a curve with a corresponding angle function. 
And so then the space of, uh, space of curves uh, would be the space of such angle functions. Okay? There are some uh, restrictions on what angle functions we allow. Uh, I'll just briefly mention this one. This says the integral of cosine of this angle function should be zero. What this means is that if I traverse along this curve, the total x, x accumulation is zero. Similarly, total y accumulation is zero. What that means is I come back to where I started. In other words, this is um, a set of closed curves, okay, representation of closed curves. And there are some other restrictions too. But it's this condition that makes this space nonlinear. If you take angle functions of closed curves and if you start just adding them up, you will see the curves open up. This is a nonlinear condition. This integral of cosine should be zero, integral of sine should be zero. Okay. Did you do anything with arc length explicitly, or you just assume pixel spacing is arc length of one? Yes, in this particular, I'm going to talk about a series of representations. The first one, we assumed it's an arc length representation. In other words, the points along the curve are equal, equally dis equal, equal distant. Okay. But that's an assumption. We don't just actually go back and resample the curve. We do resample the curve. Uh -huh. If you get the data, you may not have that assumption being satisfied. So you, you try to interpolate continuously and then resample that curve smoothly. Yeah. So there is a pre-processing step involved in this. But you'll see in a minute this condition has to be relaxed to do something more serious. The other point I was making was that we want to do shape analysis invariant to these transformations, rotations, translations, scaling, and so on and so forth. If you use a, a, an angle function to represent a curve, it's already invariant to translation. You can take the curve, take a, take a translation, but its angle function is not going to change. Rotation corresponds to adding a constant to the angle function, and we remove all rotations by, by having a condition that the average value of this angle function should be something, let's say pi. If you impose this condition, you cannot rotate this curve anymore. It has a very specific rotation involved. Okay? There is still one point left, which is where do you put the origin? Where do you start on this curve? It's a closed curve. You have to start somewhere and form an angle function. The question is where do you start? If you start at different points, you'll get different angle functions, okay? some sort of shifts of these original angle functions. All these angle functions have the same shape. They represent the same shape. So you don't want to treat them differently. You want to have a space in which all of these angle functions are just same point. And so mathematically speaking, what is done is you quotient out um, S1, which is just the unit sphere. Unit sphere corresponds to how many different ways you can put the origin on a closed curve. Okay? That's the variability is the same as that of, I shouldn't say unit sphere, unit circle. Unit circle. Okay? And so a technical way of saying that is that we quotient out from the original space the action of, uh, of, of a unit circle. And then it's the resulting space in which we, we do the shape analysis. In this resulting space, each point corresponds to a shape of interest, and all the, all the curves that, uh, that correspond to the same shape are actually the same point in this space. Okay? There is one remaining point is that once you have such a space and we want to do calculus on this space, uh, we want to do things like compute how far apart are two shapes, how different are two shapes. You really have to choose a metric to be able to do that. And in this case, we choose the most obvious one, which was just the L2 metric in these tangent spaces. Okay? Uh, there are consequences to making such choices. And um, actually, it turns out the rest of the discussion, at least in the shape analysis, is what metric one chooses. Okay. Uh, the next work we did was we, we relaxed this assumption that we have uh, arc length parameterization. Arc length parameterization, as I'll show you through some example, has certain limitations. The point in this picture is that you have these three shapes. The points along these shapes have been sampled at different rates. So the first one is uniform sampling, and these are two non-uniform sampling. Okay? But they are still the same shapes. We want to allow for the fact that we might get shapes or we want to analyze shapes with arbitrary sampling on it. Okay? And this is done by introducing, in addition to the original angle function, we introduce another function to go along with it, which says what is the speed at which you travel along this curve. Okay? Rather than studying speed, we study log of speed for some reason, but they are identical, whether you do one or other. So instead of representing the shape by one function, now we represent it with a pair of functions, the speed function and the angle function. The rest of the conditions are same as the last one, I had these integrals. These integrals were with respect to the arc length parameter. These integrals were with respect to the arc length parameter. And in this, since we don't have arc length parameter, but some other arbitrary parameterization, the integral is with respect to this arbitrary parameterization. 
Otherwise, it's the same condition that we have uh, a curve represented with a pair of functions and we are interested in closed curves. Okay? This time when we have to identify different shapes, we also have to remove one more variability which is D is the space of all possible reparameterizations of a curve. You can parameterize it non-uniformly with high speed first and low speed later on or, or any different way you want to do it. So we have to quotient out not just different placements of origin along the curve, which was S1, but how you went around the curve. Okay? So you have to mod modulo that also. In terms of the metric, it turns out this is also the same idea. We had the metric earlier. We had only one function, and we took the L2 metric on that function space or the tangent space to that function. Now what we are doing is it's the same idea, but we have two functions. So for each one, we have the corresponding L2 metric. The integration is with respect to no longer uh, arc length, but whatever the new parameterization we have. And we just arbitrarily add two constants, A and B, in the front if you want to penalize one versus another. It turns out one of the term corresponds to how you stretch and compress the curves. The other corresponds to how you bend the curves. Sometimes you want to go from one shape to another by bending more and stretching less, or by bending less and stretching more, depending upon what the application is. So you have that degree of freedom by choosing A and B. Okay. But conceptually, it continues to be the same framework and similar metric. This is called an elastic metric because this allows for the fact that you can take a curve and you can resample it very densely or very sparsely, and it actually corresponding to stretching or compressing things. Okay. In, in, in physical terms, and therefore it's called the elastic shapes. Uh, this is one consequence of it. Uh, consider these two curves. If I fix arc length parameter here and arc length parameter here, then the moment I have chosen uh, the, the starting point, let's say top of the head and the top of the head, then all the other points are immediately registered. Any point that is distance 10 from the origin is registered to the point that is distance 10 from the origin. By relaxing this uh, arc length requirement, by allowing all possible parameterization, you allow more feature matching. So it could be that this feature, so it could be that this particular feature, even though it's at a different distance from the origin, will correspond to this. The legs are open more, the legs are open less, but because of the stretching and compressing requirement, you can still match features well, even though they are at different distances from the origin. Okay. So this is rather a powerful tool, this elastic matching, in trying to preserve features. So the corresponding things go to the corresponding things. Yes? In the previous slide, we had a, all the figures were closed shapes. And yes. this, the hand is not. This is just for the illustration purpose. Uh, I am continuing to work with closed shapes. Uh, this is just for the pur purpose of this illustration. Actually, I think what my student did was manually close it and then work with it. This open sh shape is, should not be there. The whole work we have is with closed shapes. Yeah. Um, maybe it's worth making a point that it's the closure condition that makes the space nonlinear. If you allow for open curves, the problem actually simplifies. The, the space is a vector space. You can just do our ordinary calculus of this. Something uh, more recent uh, <coughs> that we are doing, this is a student of mine, uh, very recently what he did was to, to do a more general formulation of the same elastic shapes. Generalizations are the following. First of all, it's in an n-dimensional space. You can take a curve in any higher dimensional and do this thing. So what he does is he takes a curve beta. And earlier, we were representing with an angle function or angle and speed function and so on and so forth. What he does is he represents a curve beta by beta dot, which is the velocity vector, divided by the square root of the speed, magnitude of the velocity. It's not very intuitive what this function means. If I had just divided by the velocity, the, uh, the velocity by the speed, then, then what it mean, meant was that I am going with uniform speed. That was arc length parameterization. But by doing the square root, you lose sort of the physical sense. The advantage is you write down all the different uh, representations, shape, space, and all that. But if you look at the metric, it's the same elastic metric, which was rather complicated in this case. What is complication here, I didn't say that, is this metric actually depends on phi. So at every point on this manifold, it's a different metric. It makes the analysis very complicated. If you want to find the shortest path, you really have a metric defined differently at each point. The same metric uh, 
same metric magically simplifies to something very trivial just because of this choice. And so this is something that is new to us. Uh, it came about because we are working on a completely different problem. If you have worked on this problem, of putting Fisher informations on the spaces of probability densities, it turns out there is a square root representation of densities where the, the complicated Fisher information and geodesics and all that simplify completely if you replace the densities with their square root and the, that Fisher information simply becomes L2 metric. It's a great, great simplification of a very complicated area. And so what we did was we just simply applied it to this problem. If you're familiar with this, then it will make sense. Otherwise, ignore my comment on that. Uh, you can, the message to be taken here is the same elastic shapes, which are considered to be uh, fairly um, accepted by, by different people working in the community as the way to analyze shapes of curves. And the metric is rather simple. And so what this will buy us will be we'll be do, able to do things faster. This is uh, L2 metric. Lots of things can be computed faster. All right. Once we have chosen spaces and chosen metrics, and I gave you three examples, it's worth saying that lots of other people have done work in this area, and they have their own representations, and they have their own metrics. In fact, if you look at works of people like uh, David Mumford and Peter Maker, they have almost a library of metrics for the same space. And they say that under this metric, you get this behavior. Under this metric, you get this behavior. So, so, so people discuss and debate what, are metric, what good metrics are good for their problems. Okay. But once you have chosen a metric, what we want to do is, in that space I have written down script S, given any two points, what are these two points? These are just two shapes. Given these two points, I want to find the shortest path connecting them on that manifold, on that space. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you want to visualize these things in your mind, think of a sphere or an ellipsoid where I have two points on this and I want to find, connect them with the shortest path. Technically speaking, they will be geodesic. Uh, these things are too complicated to do these analytically. Yeah, these manifolds are infinite dimensional nonlinear manifolds. You can almost rule out these analytical expressions very quickly. So what you have to do is use numerical techniques. The first one that we use, we call the shooting method. And the idea, I'll just explain pictorially what it is. I want to go from this shape, this point, to this point. Think of this as my shape space, although the shape space is not as trivial as this picture, but just to give you an idea. I want to go from this point to this point. What I do is I just arbitrarily choose a direction, and I shoot a straight line or a geodesic for certain, some amount of time. Okay? So I initialize, and I shoot, and I reach here. You have to use a pen. Yeah, I think so. Or, or a laser. Maybe I can stand all the way here. Yeah, you can use a uh, yeah. It doesn't work so well for this kind of thing. We'll see. So this is my starting point, and this is my ending point. What I do is I, I shoot a geodesic. I just choose a direction, and I shoot a path, and I go a certain time. I wanted to reach here, but I reached here. I compute the amount of distance that I missed. The distance I compute in the bigger space by drawing a chord. I cannot compute the distance on the manifold because that's, all, after all, what I'm trying to do in the first place. But, but I can compute the straight line inside the bigger manifold, sort of like the chord length. And I look at the chord length, and I say, if this chord length was 0, that means I, I reached the correct spot. Okay. So in the subsequent iterations, what I do is I adjust the initial direction, the direction in which I shoot. I keep on adjusting the direction and the magnitude so that the place where I end up the place where I end up is actually the point where I want to be. Okay. I adjust the initial shooting direction so that it, it hits the point I want to be, and this is called a shooting method. Okay. This was one of the first uh, ideas we tried, and it was rather successful, but it has its limitations in, in numerical sense. The second idea is called this um, path straightening, and the idea is very simple. I don't have any picture for this. Is that you are on a manifold, and you have two points on the manifold. You want to find the shortest path between them. What you do is you initialize with an arbitrary path. Okay. Not completely arbitrary. You'll get stuck in local minimas and all that, hopefully close to the eventual solution. But you initialize it with some path. Then iteratively straighten the path till you cannot straighten it anymore. If you cannot straighten it anymore, this must be the shortest path. Okay. And how the straightening is done, although saying it in words is rather easy, is there is a formal way of doing it. You define an energy associated this, with this path. You can write down the gradient of this energy analytically. It's rather simple form. One can do this analytically and use the gradient, negative of this gradient, to update your path. If the gradient becomes 0, that means you cannot straighten it anymore. Okay? One can mathematically show critical points of this energy are geodesics. Okay? So this is the other idea. So these are the two main ideas for computing uh, 
shortest path on general manifolds. Okay. I guess if you have some very specific manifold, you can do something very specific. So here are some, some results. Uh, we, we have published a, a bunch of papers on these things, and there are lots of pictures. I just pulled out two to, to give you an idea. So this is the first shape, and this is the last shape, and this row shows the geodesic path we found, and the two, example correspond, two examples correspond to the two metrics, the very first work we did in 2002, and this is what we call the elastic metric, the second one. In this case, the first work is what, what we did 2002. We called it the bending metric. The second one is the elastic metric. And I want to show qualitatively the difference. I said what elastic things do is they help preserve the features. They match fingers with the fingers. And this was the example which was open, and we just closed it and ran the program. You see in this bottom row, the features are preserved better. There are two interesting things happening in this picture. One finger is unbending itself. So there's bending involved. And then the middle finger is compressing itself. Okay, so there's a stretching versus bending. They're, both of these phenomena are occurring in these, two exa in, this, in this pair of shapes. And look at the geodesic path. It does take care of where it needs to bend. It bends where it needs to stretch or compress. It compresses, and it does so automatically. Okay, we don't tell it where to do it. So in some sense, this is a critical test of the methods. When people write down different metrics, one should actually look at what kind of paths are you getting and do these paths make sense okay, in physical sense. Sometimes it's easy to just look at them and discuss those things. Uh, the next is once you have this sort of framework, you have this tool, uh, call it a program, a function call, that given any two shapes, I can compute geodesics in one way or another. Once you have this tool, you can do lots of stuff. I mean, it really opens up the whole area of shape analysis. And I'll give you some examples. So the first uh, simplest idea is I want to cluster shapes. I'm, I'm given a bunch of shapes. I want to cluster them into similar looking shapes. You can define, uh, clustering can be done in many, many different ways. There are sort of uh, algorithms already in place. And what we did was just pick one of those. Uh, we defined a cost function that computes the distance between shapes within the same cluster. And we, are, we want to accumulate it over all clusters, and we want to minimize it. Okay? In other words, we want to have that configuration of clusters which minimizes the sum of squares of distances within the cluster. It's like the minimum variance clustering or minimum dispersion clustering. So here is a solution. We had these 50 shapes, and each row is a cluster that algorithm comes back with. Okay. And so there are many, many examples. This is one example. There was an example, a student of mine, uh, in fact, in perhaps in this paper where you take 4,000 shapes and you cluster them up, and you see the successes and failures of the algorithm. The other idea, which is rather ambitious, is I'm given a collection of shapes. Let's say for this class, I'm given a collection of shapes. Maybe for another class, another collection. I have these observations. I want to do some statistics. I want to build a probability model. What is a probability model such that these observations came from this model with high probability? Okay, it's a rather ambitious question. Okay? Some people call it uh, learning probability models or learning of shapes and so on. So the starting point for going down this path is we define the notion of something called the average of these shapes. If I have a bunch of shapes, what is an average shape? What is a mean shape? How does even one even define it? Uh, there's been a lot of work done in this area, and uh, perhaps under different names. But the idea is to find that shape that minimizes sum of squares of distances from these given shapes. If you're given a bunch of points, think of a sphere. You're given a bunch of points on a sphere, and you're asked the question, what is the average value of these points? You find that point on the sphere which minimizes sum of squares of distances. In physics, we call it centroid. You know. the, the, the key here is that these centroids are being computed using the geodesic distances. So that tool was important okay, of computing geodesics. And so one can do this. People call it Frechet mean or Karcher mean or intrinsic means and all that. Once you have a mean, remember, we are still going after a probability distribution, not just a mean of shapes. So this is, let's say, a, cartoon of the shape space, you had a bunch of shapes, and you have computed their mean. Now we want to comp uh, study a probability distribution. So there are two challenges here. First of all, uh, the shape space is a nonlinear space. And second of all, it's infinite dimensional. So if you talk about people who study probability density functions, uh, they, they, they worry about these two problems. The nonlinear space, how do you define uh, probability distributions, densities? And it's infinite dimensional. How do you do that? Okay. So to deal with it, the first step what we do is we linearize this manifold in the neighborhood of the mean. 
you have a bunch of points on this, on this manifold. We have computed the center point. What you do is you look at the tangent space to this manifold at that point. So it's like a local flattening of the manifold at that point. You can map all these observations up into this space, and now you have a linear space, a vector space, this, this flattened space called the tangent space. It's, it's linear space, so you've solved one problem. The second problem is these, it's a very high dimensional space. We can use some standard tool for dimension reduction, for example, principal component analysis, or something else of, of your favor. So we have brought these observations, which were on a nonlinear space in a very high dimension, to a low dimensional subspace of the tangent space. Now we have a finite dimensional representation of each shape. And then you can do the usual multivariate calculus. You can do multivariate normal distributions or mixtures of normals or something else you want to do. So you, you don't know a priori, though, the manifold. So how do you do the projection, though? What we know is, um, we, uh, well, we know the manifold. But you don't have an analytic form of it. You just have the data the describing, right? No, 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 no. This is my manifold. I can write down the analytical function. Oh. I have C, I have S, I have the expression for a manifold. But your point is, how do I actually do the projection right. from point? This projection is nothing but the inverse map of the geodesic function. So in other words, if I have to explain it through words, I'm at this point mu. I want to project this point, S something, to the corresponding Xn. What I do is I find that direction in that tangent space. If I shoot a geodesic in that direction, it will take me to that sh shape. So that direction is the projection of that uh, manifold, uh, that point on the manifold onto the tangent space. This is the inverse of the exponential map. Mm -hmm. Exponential map is if you have a direction, it takes you to that point in the manifold. If you want to go back from the manifold to the tangent space, it's the inverse of the exponential map. And we have that numerical tool for computing geodesics to be able to do that. Yeah. So this is a very local picture. So yes. How do you compute the distribution across tangent spaces? Uh, in this case, there is uh, only one tangent space, and we have used uh, all the points will be brought up back to the tangent space. And one can, in principle, do it as long as this mapping is one to one and on to. And I think the point you're referring to is that if the shapes are very far scattered, for example, just think of a unit circle. If you have uh, points all over the unit circle, and if you just pick up one point and try to flatten it, bring it back up, there may not be a, an un unambiguous way of doing that. There is, at least that, that diametrically opposite point can be brought here or it can be brought here. So in those situations, there are sets of measure zero where you have an ambiguous way of pulling it back. But for all practical purposes, there is actually a unique way of pulling it back onto this tangent space. And once you have this one-to-one -one onto mapping, uh, you can develop a probability distribution here, and you can project it back if you want, and it will go in a unique way. Mathematically speaking, I mean, mathematics ensures us. Just uh, the example I gave you, if you take the circle, okay. other than that one point, everything else can be flattened uniquely. Okay? Uh, so we rely on the fact that the, the, the points for which there is ambiguity are sets of measure, measure zero, so they will, should not occur in, in practice. It's the usual argument you hide behind. So these are some examples of the means. I had those three classes. We compute the mean of each class. And in the tangent space, you can do principal component analysis, look at the eigenvalues, decay, and use the, do the usual multivariate calculus. You can do furthermore. You can start generating random shapes here. You can generate random samples from those multivariate distributions in the tangent space, construct the tangent vector, and project it back onto the manifold. You start getting random shapes. And so these are examples of random shapes from those classes. Okay, so you can actually synthesize new shapes. So this tool actually gives us a probability model. The point I'm making is you can have some observations and from which you can build a probability model for those shapes. And I'm going to use that in the next setup. The idea in this problem is that I want to estimate a curve in an image. Okay, this is the usual curve estimation contour extraction problem. I have an image. I have an object in the image. And I want to extract its boundary. Okay, this has been done for at least 15 years now. Okay, there's a lot of work in there. The standard way of doing it is there are these curve evolution techniques. You initialize a curve, and you follow the gradient of certain energy and let the curve evolve according to that. The energies are based generally the way they are done uh, in the literature. They are based on the image itself, of course. You want to extract something from the image, and you want to keep the curve smooth. If you just let it run from the image, the curve will be a mess. Okay? You keep it smooth at every state. 
What we want to do is, in addition to having these two terms, we want to have a third term which says, I know the shape that I'm looking from comes from a specific family. The shape that I'm looking for comes from a specific family. I have a probability distribution. It's a tank looked at from a certain angle. It's an object that I know what shape class does it belong to. So I want to use that additional information. And how do I put that in? And so this is what is done in, uh, I will quickly go through and just try to do it pictorially. So here is an example of an image. This is what is called a gradient vector field. This is one of the existing techniques in the literature, is you sort of form an optical flow on the image domain, and you let the curve evolve according to this optical flow, and it settles at some point. And if it is, a, if it is done in a correct way, or if it is done in a favorable way, way it, it settles down at uh, boundaries of objects in the images. Okay? But if, you, if the image is telling you the wrong thing, if the data is not the right one, you know, the object is partially obscured, it's partially hidden, the, the quality of image is so bad, the, the edges are not visible at all. In that case, you want to bring in this additional piece of information, which is the prior, that I know that objects that I'm looking for come from a certain class. I may not know exactly which object this one is, but I know the general probability distribution of these sort of objects. Then how do you use that? And so you can, instead of doing the gradient of the first two terms, you do the gradient of first three terms, and then this is the evolution. It keeps you, the prior energy keeps you away from the, what the data is telling you in some, in, in some areas of the image. Okay. And so there are several more examples of these things uh, my student has prepared, but um, I think it will take a lot of time to show all of them. But this was one practical example where we have a sequence of these um, ECG images, and as I mentioned earlier, the goal was to extract the boundaries of these cardiac layers, the inside curves and the outside cardiac curves. Okay. This is what we want to do. It turns out the doctor can give us, so you have a whole movie of this thing, heart beating. The doctor can go in and do it at certain frames, maybe every 10th frame, every 30th frame, every 100th frame, he can do it by hand. And the goal is to interpolate in between. You fill in, that's the goal. So the first frame is given by a doctor, the last frame is given by a doctor. We trust that. And what we wanted to do was just fill in. So what we do is, first of all, we initialize a path by simply computing a geodesic between the first and the last just straight line in that shape space. So it gives you some, in, some initial condition, and then use that gradient of these energies from that initialization. And if the initialization is close enough, you, you settle on to some of these boundaries. Okay. So this, this work has been well received. They liked the, the people who gave us this problem liked it, but they also wanted us to prepare a package and make it fast enough so that they can include it in their laboratory, and that's the part we are not good in. I'm sure somebody else is and somebody else will do these things down the line. Uh, this problem I mentioned about uh, recognizing people from a distance. So what was the issue here? Uh, you have a, a video sequence, a sequence of images. For each frame, you have an image. And from that image, you can extract a boundary. Okay? At this stage, assume that we have boundaries. And in fact, we have sequence of boundaries. Okay? And we have it for different subjects. Rather than comparing one shape, what we want to do is compare a sequence of shapes with a sequence of shapes. Okay? Technically speaking, what we'd want to do is we want to analyze a stochastic process. It's a time index sequence of shapes. Okay? So this is what uh, one of my student, Dave Kaziska, did was he thought of these observations as the realizations of a stochastic process on our shape space and exploited some structure. For example, when we are walking, if you look at the shape from a side, there is some sort of a periodic nature to the walk. We repeat um, every step of the gate, and this is called a gate cycle, half cycle and full cycles. So we repeat these gate cycles. So he formulated this as a cyclostationary processes. Underlying statistics are assumed to be um, periodic. With those assumptions, if you have to compare two gate cycles, you can compute uh, some sort of metric on the space of uh, such cycles by comparing the corresponding uh, shapes in the sequence. So you have two sequences of shapes. What you have to do is register which shape corresponds to which shape. And once you have done the registration, this is done through this phi and kappa, then you just compute the, the corresponding geodesic distances between the shapes. You can integrate it over the cycle, and that gives you a metric. Okay? So this was tried for a, a rather small set, 26 people in our, in our department. And and in his experiment for this nearest neighbor, if you want the nearest neighbor classification, he got 17 out of 26 right. Okay. 
So this is neither a validation of the method nor a rejection of a method. It's too small a sample size, but it shows that the tool that we have for comparing shapes has some success, okay, if, if, if applied correctly. Uh, the, the last few points I want to make, uh, one is the extension to facial surfaces. So I, I said at the start we are interested in shapes of curves and surfaces. The difficulty in comparing surfaces is that there is no ordering of points. We want to compare two surfaces. We want to do it the way we have done the curves. We want to compute a whole geodesic path between faces on the space of faces. Okay? So it's rather a daunting problem. Um, and the main challenge in, in going about doing it is on curves, there is an ordering of points that gives you a lot of structure. On faces, on surfaces, there is no ordering of points. Without that, if you want to compare two surfaces, you really have to modulo out all possible parameterizations of surface. That's the real ideal way of comparing surfaces, and that's nearly impossible. It's rather difficult to do. What we have done is we have, we have put a particular coordinate system on faces, and once you impose a particular coordinate system, then you can compare the corresponding points on the faces. And this is how we do the coordinate system. What we do is we, we write uh, a surface as a collection of curves, actually much like the work that is going on here. Uh, maybe the work going on here is much more general in this sense. This is a very specific instance of it. We fix the tip of the nose, okay? And we define a function on the surface which says how far away you are from the nose. So you have now a function defined on the whole surface. If you look at the level curves of that function, you get curves like these. Okay? So, so the zero level curve is actually the tip and everything else around. As you increase the distance, you move away from that. So you get this collection of curves. You can call them something, we call them facial curves. You can look at rather dense collection of, of curves. So you can rep replace a surface with a very dense collection. In fact, you have, you have all the information that you started with. You have not lost any information. You can reconstruct the surface if you want. The, the advantage of doing this thing is if we want to compare two surfaces, and if you represent each one of them as collection of curves, we have tools for comparing shapes of curves. That's what I did in the first part of my talk. And so this is what we do. We, we, we've established correspondences between this set of curves and this set of curves, and then just compute the geodesic paths between the corresponding curves. So you can fill up the whole surface by just, just building the correspondences between the curves. And then you can almost paint the intermediate surfaces like that. So this is an example of form forming such a geodesic path. So first surface is given to us. The last surface is given to us. These are actual observations. We represented each one of them by about, with about 70 curves each, computed the geodesic between the corresponding curves, each pair, the 70 curves, and then just rendered the surface generated by these intermediate curves. So this gives you a path of surfaces. Okay? This is uh, the, the, the technique of doing it, but there's an underlying mathematics. The underlying mathematics says that if you define a path of surface, a, a set of surfaces where each surface is an index collection of curves, you can mathematically write down the, the Riemannian metric for that space. You can write down what should be the geodesic, and one can actually show this is technically a geodesic path for the metric we chose between these two um, surfaces in that space where each surface is a point. Okay, so this, uh, uh, with, a, with, a, with a very specific parameterization that we have chosen for the surface, under that specific parameterization, this is a geodesic path. Okay, so this is a path, and these are just two different views of that path. Um, the last couple of points uh, is these are the works that I'm starting to do. Uh, so I'm just trying to show you some other applications of shape analysis. One is that the shapes, when you're, stu you're interested in studying uh, objects and images, objects seldom occur by themselves. Or well, if they occur by themselves, the problem is sometimes simplified. You can identify and isolate them. But very often they occur in groups, and there is interaction between the shapes. Much like if you look at marker random field models and images, if you look at a pixel, there is a high probability of correlation with the neighboring pixels. Okay? And people have exploited it for many years. They call it the marker random field models, and you use that to do things with the images. What we want to do is mark our random fields in shape spaces. We have a number of objects in images. We are going, going to define graphs, and we will define neighboring objects, and we'll use the shape of neighboring objects to influence the shape we are interested in, okay? just like updating this mark of random fields. And so this is, there is a framework for that, and we have written down, well, I guess I don't have that slide. So we have written down this sort of energy functions, the way one defines in mark of random fields. 
and uh, it has certain terms. There are terms which involve interaction between the shapes. There are terms that involve actual images that you are looking for, image, images that are driving the shapes. And so here is a cartoon example that I look at this shape. I want, uh, th well, this collection of shapes, this configuration of shapes, and I want to simulate it. So what I've done is I've taken these shapes and computed the average of these. So there are one, two, three, four, five shapes, and this is the average shape. I start from this as an initial ra random configuration of five objects. And using some um, favorable definitions of these energies, I drive this configuration in a way that I get something like this without using any image information. Okay? So, the, so the, uh, the energies were saying that each one of the shapes should get closer to this shape. Uh, their orientation should get as far away as possible. The overlap um, is being penalized. Uh, their, their center points are being forced to come together. So the combination of this, these different terms drives you towards a favorable energy configuration. So this is just a rather preliminary conceptual example that you are not evolving just one shape, you are evolving multiple shapes, and the shapes will interact with each other. So if one shape is obscured and all the other shapes are clearly visible, if you see tanks, 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 and this one is, you don't know what it is, you see a part of it, then with high probability you'll call it tank because the neighbors will influence the decision. Okay? So it's that philosophy. Uh, this last piece of work I'm working with, with my student Nikolai Barlow is about uh, uh, bundles of shapes. We not only want to compare individual shapes, but we want to collect collection, uh, compare collection of shapes. So this is a problem that is relevant in uh, DT MRI image analysis where one extracts these bundles of these fiber tracks. So you have these bundles, and you are asking the question, how is this bundle different from this bundle? Can you quantify it? Okay, can you do a classification, a formal classification? It's not just individual shapes. This is rather simple in our framework, although this is with open curves. Um, what we do is we define a space of curves, a collection of curves like this, a bundle of curves, gives us a bunch of points in that space. So each bundle corresponds to a little cloud of points. And so if you have two bundles, then you have two clouds, and we want to compare it. So what we can do is we can compute an underlying probability density for this bundle, for this cloud, underlying probability density for this cloud, and the remaining task is to compare the probability densities. Okay. This part is, this, this is still not trivial because if you think about a manifold or a sphere, if you have one probability di distribution centered on one point, another probability distribution centered on another point, it's not just trivial to just compare them. You really have to bring them to the same coordinate system through something called parallel translation, and then you can compare them. But if these things are known and one can study these things. Yes? representation for the, the individual curves in a bundle? I'm assuming this is the data that is given to us. So somebody has extracted these fibers or some sort of curves, and we have uh, the coordinates, let's say, for each one of the curves. Okay. That that's what I'm assuming I have. Uh, in future, what I would really like to do is something I described earlier. If I can study hand-extracted, let's say a doctor goes in and extracts these things from the data. So I have lots of reliable data. I would like to learn probability models for these bundles, and then I would like to use these probability models in future extraction, in automation of the extraction, you know, use the past knowledge for future inferences, that sort of idea. But at this stage, for this data set, we are assuming we actually have the curves okay, in, the, in a convenient form. Okay, so this is uh, another area or application which is useful. We are working on, all right. So I will summarize uh, the, the talk by mentioning with that we started with the analysis of planar curves, and what we have done is looked at different representations and different metrics. We have done about two or three metrics. Other people have done many more. The, the basic idea in the tool that, that we need is for any choice of metric, if you want to compare shapes or if you want to do statistics of shape, if you want to do analysis of shapes, you need this tool called the geodesic calculation, and there are also several ways of doing that itself. But once you have this tool, you can do things like calculation of a mean shape or a covariance of the space a collection of shapes and so on and so forth. Once you have probability models, you can talk about Bayesian es estimation because you can use the probability models as a prior for future ones. Other applications, uh, dynamic shape analysis, uh, facial surface shape analysis, configuration of shapes, bundle of curves, and there are many more. Once you have the tool running, it's one of those sayings that if you have a hammer, you see the nails everywhere. And this is what, what we are doing. And we, once we have a good tool on analyzing shapes, we are seeing applications everywhere. All right. Thank you very much.
we have some time for questions. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, can we back to the slides for you introducing the shape representations? Um, you represent the shape with an angle function, which is uh, actually a tangent along the curves. It's the angle and of the tangent ve vector, yes. Yeah, you say another, there is another function you say is a log speed. Yes. And is that related to the curvature of, a, of your curve? If you, if you go back to this function, it's, it's worth mentioning a few more things. So I said one way to represent this curve is just take the x and y coordinates along the path. That's one representation. Right. Other is what we, are, what we are using, which is the angle of the velocity vector as you go along the curve. The third is if you look at the derivative of this angle function uh, versus this x, uh, s-axis, this gives you the curvature of the curve right. along this thing. So that's another representation of the curve. So there are several possibilities. Actually, is the derivative of your, the, of your angle. No, no, no. This is assuming arc length, so the speed is constant. Okay. Assume arc length parameterization. If you right. bring in the speed, then the formula is a little complicated, but in principle similar. So this is arc length parameterization. The speed is constant. If you have an angle function, if you just take the derivative, this is nothing but the curvature function. So there are these different representation, and it's the same issues the group here is dealing with, is the more derivatives you take, the more invariances you get. On the other hand, the more derivatives you take, the more susceptible to noise you are. Sure. If you start involving second derivatives or curvature, so that's why we, we settled on a compromise, the first derivative, the angle function. Okay? So there are some invariances, and it's still not as susceptible to noise. Okay. That's an important question. Any other questions? Um, you talked about using the square root of velocity as a metric that was that was easier to compute. As a representation. Yeah. Beta um, is a curve, and I'm going to represent it with this function, which has the square root of velocity. You know, is, this is the formula. Yeah. I'm just curious uh, what type of you know loss in quality you get from making that assumption that isn't based on like a physical reason, but. Yeah, because you were saying that you know it yeah. didn't really have a direct physical. It doesn't have represent. It, it, it doesn't have interpretation in terms of what this function q is. If if I was working with just beta dot, I know it's a velocity. If I was working with beta dot over norm of beta dot dot, I know this is an arc length parameterization. So I do not have any physical interpretation for this q. But what I have is that if I use this metric, and I construct the paths these paths will be identical to the paths I got under this metric. It turns out it's a different, so, so you have a manifold, you can represent points of manifolds under different representations, and under different representation, the same metric can take different forms. It turns out it's the same metric. If I compute the path, it will be the same path as this one, as, as under this one. It's just that the representation is different, and the way, the form that metric takes is different. But the actual path will be the same. And that path, in the previous case, I had a very nice interpretation that this was the optimal stretching and bending of one shape into another. So I retain the interpretation from the previous setup. All I need to show is, mathematically speaking, if I can get these clicks right, mathematically speaking, I have to show that the optimal path under this representation and this metric are identical to the optimal paths in the previous one, and that, that we show. So, so the point of this is just simplifying the previous thing. In terms of achievement, we achieved the same thing as we, uh, as we did previously. But this simplified the programming, the interpretation, everything so much more. There's this whole deal. If you have these manifolds embedded in a bigger space, but if at each point the metric is different based on where you are, the whole calculation becomes so messy. And, and, and this is so much more easier. Uh, there are implications, as I was saying, that this last point is actually very important. Um, we are only dis discovering this particular fact. I think I learned it only last summer. Uh, and, and we have looked into the literature. Maybe you guys know more about it, but I think there are implications here. I think Amari talks about it. If you go back to this, uh, but not the square root. But no, they, they talk about square root representations, and they call it the Hellinger metric and so on and so forth. But very few people have actually computed uh, the geodesics. In the past, the way it was done was uh, they assumed different representation as of the same thing, and they use Fisher information metric, and they compute the geodesics, but they do it numerically because it's a complicated form. But if you use this fact, then it turns out that the space becomes a sphere, and the geodesic on a sphere is, we can write down formula for
Yeah, we it simplifies. Simplified, uh, I think uh, Shuo and uh, basically working on those Jensen uh, Shannon uh, metrics and things. It turns out that you can actually by taking by taking the uh, the square root of that uh, function, yeah. uh, you, uh, you you can show that it, it, it's a uh, nice distance, a nice metric. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, the metric. I mean, metric-wise, it's identical. But it's the same uh, metric. It's a different. Uh, you're right. It's a different way of calculating it, and it's a closed form. Yeah. Everything is closed form because it becomes a sphere. The space, which was a complicated manifold with some definition of metric, suddenly becomes a sphere. So that would be interesting. It's actually rather easy to see why it becomes a sphere. If you have a density represented by a square root, you know probability density integrates to 1. So you have a function whose square integrates to 1. So it's an element of an infinite dimensional sphere. So the whole space of probability densities is nothing but a convex subset of a sphere. And now everything is analytical. Does Guy Lebanon's paper talk about that? Guy Lebanon's paper was learning. You mean the, the one on text uh, right, metrics? Right, right. His paper is somewhat different. His paper asked a very ambitious question, which we are not doing. He said that I have a collection of observations, and I'm representing these uh, in, in some space of shapes. And I'm asking the question, under what metric these shapes from the same class are close to each other? So he's searching for the metrics from the data. And so he, he learns. Uh, that's a very ambitious question. Based metric, if what he does, yeah. So he, when he's searching over the space of metrics, he defines a one-parameter family whose center is this Jeffrey's prior, Jeffrey's metric. Yeah. But that's the question if we can ask here would be really ambitious, which is telling the data what the metric is rather than us choosing what metric is. Any other question? Well, if not, let's thank our speaker. So, uh, sure, you, you